Uh, let me welcome you to this lecture six of uh, our course on topics in reinforcement learning. In lecture four, we covered approximation value space and in lecture five, we went into rollout, which is a form of approximation in value space with the approximating function being the cost function of some uh, base policy or base heuristic. And now we are going to look at uh, two particular applications of uh, rollout in model predictive control and also in multi-agent problems. And we are going to start with model predictive control a very important methodology in control system design. We're going to talk about that, its relation to rollout and also variations of it. And uh, then we're going to talk about multi-agent problems where the control consists of multiple components with one component uh, corresponding to one agent. Um, and uh, we're going to discuss uh, how we can alleviate some of the difficulties of these problems by using rollout ideas, uh, a method that's called multi-agent rollout, which is uh, very economical in terms of uh, its, uh, its uh, computations, online computations. Then we're going to talk about the issue of autonomy in the context of multi-agent systems, where the agents uh, act on their own. They apply control based on uh, information that they have. And uh, we're going to talk about how we can design information distribution systems that facilitate this type of multi-agent rollout. Then we're going to discuss about a uh, special application. I'm going to show you some videos, OK? Uh, this uh, is uh, uh, work with uh, uh, some ASU collaborators, it's very recent, and uh, it deals with a multi-agent uh, POMDP problem, imperfect state information problem. That's quite challenging. So let me get started with uh, model predictive control. Uh, its principal area of applications is in control system design, and in particular, its problems that involve infinite control spaces were some of the ideas that we discussed in connection with the deterministic rollout uh, do not apply because the number of Q factors is infinite here at any one state. And there are two major types of problems in control system design. One is called the regulation problem, where you want to keep the state of the system near some given point. Traditionally, this point is taken to be the origin, zero of a Euclidean space. Uh, if it's some other point, then we can make a translation of the coordinates so that, so that that point of interest becomes the origin in the new coordinate system. Um, so for example, this, uh, this uh, inverted pendulum problem, a classical uh, problem that is uh, uh, a good test bed for algorithms, but also is intuitive and it relates to keeping this, this pole that has a mass at the end of it, keeping it upright, uh, which corresponds to this angular velocity being zero, and I'm sorry, the angular position being zero and the angular velocity being zero. That's the place where we want to keep this pole. And we want to do this by applying control horizontally on this car, we move the car so that this mass gets to the upright position and stays there. Uh, so this is a regulation problem. And another major problem involves following a given trajectory, controlling the system close to some given trajectory. Like, for example, we have this car here, and we have a trajectory that we wanted to follow that goes from point A to point B. And uh, we want to do this with minimum cost, but also observing various constraints. In uh, automated car um, uh, designs, uh, there are a lot of constraints that, uh, that you have to observe. For example, there are control constraints like uh, 
there are velocity constraints, how fast or how slow the car can go, um, acceleration constraints, uh, and this play also with the state constraints. And the state constraints may be staying on the road, um, avoid some fixed obstacles, and also avoid moving obstacles like other cars that may be crossing into your path. And uh, uh, so we have to worry about things like going too fast into a turn, and we have to reduce velocity before we go into the turn. Uh, similarly, we have to worry about cars crossing into our path, and we have to do online replanning, just get around of those, uh, of those moving obstacles. Now, when these constraints are, are critical, they are safety constraints, and you can't, uh, you can't deal them in a soft manner, deal with them with this in, in, in an indirect way. You have to deal with them directly. Unfortunately, the linear quadratic formulation, a classical control formulation that we have discussed in this course, is often inadequate in this, uh, in this context because it does not deal directly with state and control constraints. It deals with them indirectly by using these quadratic penalties that may be violated in the formulation of the problem. This is not acceptable in situations like this. And this has given uh, rise to the uh, to, to methodologies that respect, uh, fully respect the state and control constraints and model predictive control is one of these uh, methodologies, a uh, principal one. Okay, so now we're going to deal, there are many different formulations of the model predictive control problem, and we're going to call the MPC, abbreviate MPC, it's a popular acronym. So there are many different types of MPC formulations, and, but the one that we're going to deal with is the original one, which dates back to the late 80s. We have a, a system that's deterministic, state XK, control UK, and this is, can be linear or nonlinear, um, but it has an origin, an absorbing state. Zero is a state that once you go into, you stay there, okay? That's what this means. No matter what control you apply, once you reach the origin, you stay there. Of course, this is an idealization that would not be true if the problem was stochastic and there was some noise here, but we consider in this formulation a deterministic problem as an approximation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so now the cost structure of this problem encodes our desire to go to the origin with minimum cost. So there has to be an incentive for driving the system to the origin. And this is encoded by positivity of the cost, except at the origin where there is no cost. The origin is cost-free. No matter what control we apply, once we are at the origin, we stay at the origin at no cost. And we have control constraints. We don't have any state constraints. Uh, there are extensions of this formulation that involve state constraints, and I'm going to discuss them a little later, but for simplicity, we are going to keep state constraints out of this formulation. We also assume perfect state information. The control is applied with full knowledge of the state. In practice, when this may not be satisfied, but what people often do is to use estimates of the state as if they were exact. So in other words, there may be an estimator that uh, tries to figure out where the state is and then forms an estimate based on observations, which are used then by the controller as if by the MPC controller, as if they were exact. There are also other formulations involving imperfect state information, but this is a common one. It's easy to explain. Okay, so this is the problem. And what does MPC do? Well, at a state XK, it solves an L step look ahead version of the problem and requires that the terminal state is exactly zero while satisfying the constraints. In other words, at, S at XK, it looks ahead L steps 
and tries to bring the state exactly at zero, minimizing the intervening cost. And of course, once the state is at zero, it stays at zero. So, um, <clears throat> then assuming that it can solve this problem, of course, the original problem may have much longer horizon, may have an infinite horizon. So this problem is uh, easier, okay, it has shorter horizon. And uh, uh, there are ways to address problems like that, particularly since it is deterministic uh, and the, the, the self step problem is deterministic, we assume that this can be done, okay. Now, assume that at XK you have solved this L step problem. You have obtained a control sequence, an optimal control sequence for this problem. And then you apply at XK the first component of the solution and you discard all the rest. It's like a rollout, where at some state you apply a heuristic and you obtain a trajectory. And then you keep the first step of the trajectory and you discard the rest. And indeed, there's a close connection between MPC and rollout, uh, which I'm going to discuss now. Okay, so what does rollout do? Uh, it minimizes over Q factors. And these Q factors involve minimization over the first stage, over the control, the Q factor at XK and UK. It calculates this Q factor and then applies a base heuristic for the remainder. So this looks pretty much like uh, what we have in MPC. And in fact, you can see that MPC is rolled out with a base heuristic being an L minus one minimization to zero, okay? Not L step minimization. The base heuristic is the L minus one minimization that is at the tail end of this figure. So this is first cost minimis first step minimization and then base heuristic and L minus one H stages minimization. And we can fold the first stage with the remaining L minus one stages into a single minimization to obtain an L step minimization, which is exactly what MPC does. So MPC does this L step minimization, but the base heuristic starts from the state XK plus one. And uh, Let's call H of X the optimal cost of the base heuristic starting from X. So we are at some state X, we do this L minus one step minimization and the cost of this minimization is denoted by H of X. Similar to the notation that we have been using for all out for base heuristics. Now, it turns out that this heuristic is sequentially improving. Okay, we talked about sequential improvement and sequential consistency also. It turns out that this heuristic is sequentially improving. It is not sequentially consistent. And uh, I can explain this briefly, but we're not going to insist too much about that. It's not sequentially consistent because if I start here and apply this base heuristic and then move to the next state here, the base heuristic from this next state is going to take you one step forward. So it's not going to be the same trajectory as the one that the base heuristic generated from this state. So it's not sequentially consistent, but it turns out that it's sequentially improving. And uh, the definition of course of sequential improvement is this inequality here. The minimal Q factor at X is less than the cost of the base heuristic. The minimal heuristic Q factor, going one step and applying the heuristic from the next state. And this holds trivially, okay? It's very simple to see why this holds. Why? Because the right-hand side is the optimal cost from X to zero in L minus one steps, okay? From X to zero in L minus one steps. And then stay at zero for the additional steps. Now the left-hand side involves the first step minimization and then L minus one step minimization. 
and then stay at zero for the remaining steps. So this optimal cost to reach zero in L steps is less than the optimal cost to reach zero in L minus one steps, because the solution of this problem is a feasible solution for the solution of this problem, a feasible solution for this problem, and the optimal solution for this problem is better than the feasible solution. So we have this very simply. And now once we have this base heuristic being sequentially consistent, being sequentially improving, a lot of nice things follow, including cost improvement. The cost of the rollout policy is less than the cost of the heuristic applied from the same initial condition. And this translates to this inequality here. This is the cost of the rollout, okay, for a given initial condition here, let's consider the state and control sequence generated by MPC, okay, and the rollout algorithm that underlies MPC starting from X0. Then sequential improvement implies that over N steps, this cost is going to be less than the cost of the base heuristic L minus one minimization starting from X zero. And this is finite. So as you go forward and you generate more and more controls and states, this sum remains bounded. And because the cost is positive, unless you are at zero, the only way this can stay bounded is if you approach either reach zero exactly or approach it at a fast enough rate. Control engineers define this as stability, okay? Bringing the system to zero, the reference point regulated there at small cost, bring it and keeping it there, uh, keeping it there. That's the notion of stability, which for control engineers is paramount. Control engineers don't care nearly as much for optimal cost or low cost as they care about stability. If your system is not stable, forget it. We don't even, we're not going to even look at it. So that was the main selling point of MPC. It's not just that it reduces cost through rollout, but it generates a stable controller. And uh, people have been playing around with different versions of MPC, trying for the most part to keep this stability property intact. Okay, are there any questions so far on MPC and how it relates to rollout? I have a question. Um, so you don't necessarily know uh, if you're at state XK that you will be able to reach state zero within L steps, right? Um, right, so you it, don't know that. Okay. Uh, so you're right, it's a good question. Yeah, go ahead. Was, um, well, I was thinking is the idea just to try to make as much progress towards state zero as possible but if you happen to reach state zero uh, before the L steps are up, then you just stay there. Is that the idea? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, this constraint that you reach this, the, the reach zero in L steps is a hard constraint. It's part of the method. Okay. Now I'm going to get into a variant of MPC which does not have this requirement, but in this formulation of MPC, uh, it is a requirement that you reach the the, the origin in L steps. And if L is not enough, you just increase it, okay? And there's a certain, uh, this is an assumption here in our context. However, uh, in control theory, there's a concept of controllability, being able to reach from any one state, uh, any other state in a certain number of steps. And the number of steps for n-dimensional system is typically n, otherwise we don't have controllability. So implicitly here, we assume controllability that you can get from any state into the origin in L steps. And L must be large enough to be able to do that, 
Okay, and then so L, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, go ahead. L, L doesn't need to be constant from from iteration to iteration, right? Well, in this slide, it has to be constant. Uh, mm -hmm. It it is constant, uh, at least for for the base heuristic. Now, okay. Okay, in this for in, for this slide, it's supposed to be constant. In variance of the method, it may be it may not be constant. Okay, so there's just an assumption that you will always be able to reach zero within L steps. Or in, exactly, this is this is an assumption here, and I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So now let's deal with this question. Um, when uh, L is not enough, okay? And uh, you can't reach the, in L steps, the origin from some initial states. So instead of having a hard constraint that the origin, that we reach the origin in L steps, we introduce a soft constraint. We introduce instead, we get rid of this, and we introduce a terminal cost function that penalizes large deviations from zero, okay? This G is usually a cost function that is zero at zero and is positive uh, outside zero. So now this becomes the MPC problem, okay? You are at state X zero, you go L steps, minimize the cost subject to the constraints and you require you add an additional terminal cost to compensate for deviations from the origin. Now, the sequential improvement property is important for implying stability. And how do we choose G now so that sequential improvement holds in the context of rollout? Clearly, we can interpret this MPC in terms of rollout just that the L minus one step problem is going to change involving now a terminal cost approximation, but is it going to be sequentially improving? Well, it turns out that it will be provided G satisfies a certain condition. Okay, this looks suspicious like a sequential improvement condition, right? This looks like a Q factor and uh, this looks like if G were a heuristic, if G of X were the cost of a base of some base heuristic, then you would have cost improvement. Um, the, you have sequential improvement, I'm sorry. And indeed, you can prove that if this Lyapunov condition is satisfied by G, then the base heuristic that goes L steps L minus one steps ahead optimally with this terminal cost function is sequentially improving. And uh, the proof is straightforward using this condition at the right point. And uh, if you eyeball it for five minutes, you'll understand it because it's straightforward. However, it requires some algebra here. And I'm not going to insist on explaining every little steps of the algebra. Uh, I have explanations for each equation. I'm going to go through it uh, just to give you the gist of the proof. Okay, we want to prove that the L minus one optimal solution heuristic is sequentially improving. So let's call H the cost function of this heuristic. And what we want to prove is that this is less than this, okay? the optimal Q factor starting at X zero and using the base heuristic is less than the cost of the base heuristic starting from X zero. Okay, so what's the definition of H is the optimal cost of the base heuristic, which involves an L minus one step minimization. Let the X bars here be the optimal controls and states corresponding to this minimization. So we go from X zero to a state X bar L minus one with the intermediate cost over the L minus one stages here. Okay, look at this, it goes to L minus two 
and then adds one more step. So it's L minus one cost that incurred. Okay, so now we have G at X bar L minus one. And we apply the Lyapunov condition, this condition here for X equals X bar L minus one. Then I'm going to get an inequality for some X bar L and U bar L minus one that attain the minimum here, we have this, we strengthen the inequality by replacing this with this and the L minus one term in this summation, okay? So we play this trick using this Lyapunov condition. And now this is true for some sequence of X bars and U bars, this is more than the minimum of this expression over the controls U, okay? What is this now? This is the optimal cost of the L-step problem. That's the problem that MPC solves at X0. And also by taking the minimization inside with respect to the controls U1 up to UL minus one, we obtain that this is just this term here, plus the minimum of this plus that, which is H from the next state. So I have proved that this, the optimal cost of the base heuristic uh, starting at X zero is uh, greater than the minimal Q factor corresponding to the same state X zero. Okay, so like I said, this requires, I, I very much urge you to look at these steps uh, carefully. I have broken it down as much as I can. Still, it's a lot of notation, a lot of algebra, but I urge you to spend some time to understand this, uh, uh, this uh, computation. And incidentally, Lyapunov conditions are very important in control theory. There's a lot of theory about how to design them and so on. How do you find this G? What are the methods for designing uh, G in control theory that uh, satisfy this condition or something similar to that? Are there any questions before I go to the next slide? Okay, let's look at other variations of MPC. Like I said, it's a vast field. There's a lot of uh, different uh, ideas floating around, a lot of extensions. A major extension introduces state constraints, like safety constraints, like a car should not bump onto other cars or should not bump onto a road barrier or it should not go off a turn into a cliff. Um, so this, constraints are generally encoded as a tube constraint, a tube of within state space that the state must stay on. XK must be within a set X for all K. Tubes can be also time varying, but I'm, I'm having them here, I'm showing them here uh, as time invariant. And uh, uh, Okay, now the, the complications are significant because in order to stay within a tube, uh, at some point to be within the tube, you have to take precautions to be in the right place a few steps earlier. In other words, uh, unless th there will be states within X from which it's impossible to stay in the future within the tube. Like for example, if, uh, if you approach a turn on the road at a high speed, then it may be impossible to stay within the road because you're going too fast. And it's also necessary to slow down well before you get there in order to be able, so you have to be within a subset of the constraint set of the state constraint set in order to be able to meet the constraint in the future. So this leads to the methodology of reachability of target tubes. So given a tube, construct an inner tube, a subset of that tube from within which the state constraints can be met. You can always stay there. 
Okay. Now that's, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to spend a lot of time on this, uh, any time on the problem of reachability, which by the way, is very dear to my heart. This was the subject, or at least a major part of my PhD thesis 50 years ago. I was the one who introduced this concept of reachability of target tubes and gave algorithms in my thesis for attaining, constructing inner tubes and so on. Uh, now, my thesis was totally neglected, disregarded for 15, 20 years, and then people paid some attention to it once it reached the uh, once once uh, MPC became popular, and then this became a major issue, the reachability became a major issue within the context of MPC. So there's a lot of literature on the reachability of target tubes, and I invite you to read my thesis, of course, which is on the internet at my website. But I also recommend that you take a look at this uh, video lecture from two years ago which goes into some detail on reachability, has uh, several slides on reachability. But we're going to leave it here as a major extension that we are not going to address uh, in our course. Another variant of MPC uh, deals with simplification. Uh, okay, so MPC, uh, solves an L minus one step problem as a base heuristic, but this can be also quite difficult to solve because it involves uh, complicated constraints and so on. However, we saw in the rollout, we saw in the context of rollout that we can use simplified rollout. Simplified rollout means that given a heuristic which has cost h of x that satisfies the sequential improvement condition, we don't have to solve this problem, find the minimal q factor, but instead we can use any control for which this inequality is satisfied. Not the optimal one, but just any control. This is simplified rollout and I explained it in the previous lecture. Now we can use MPC with this kind of simplified uh, uh, minimization, and it turns out that this uh, is uh, useful in some contexts, one of which I'm going to discuss uh, in, um, in this uh, lecture later on. There are also other variants of MPC involving time varying systems, finite horizon and time varying systems, stochastic problems, minimax problems, multi Asian problems. And uh, I'm going to look a little bit into this uh, later in uh, this lecture. Uh, there are many variations, a lot of methodology, and this is just the beginning. And I should also say that uh, the theory of MPC is not uh, it sort of was developed independently of rollout, reinforcement learning, and so on. In my opinion, it is important to make the connection with reinforcement learning and rollout because there can be some useful cross fertilization between MPC theory and methodology and also reinforcement learning methodology. So we're going to leave this at that and uh, go into multi agent problems. Are there any questions on MPC before we leave the subject. Okay, uh, multi agent problems. I talked about them briefly in uh, lecture three. And as I said, that's a very old uh, field, uh, goes this back to the 60s. And uh, in fact, uh, my PhD work, uh, I spent six months working on this field and got discouraged because it was so difficult, at least uh, in the time in, in, for those times. Uh, uh, but uh, the field has has uh, gathered a lot of uh, steam, a lot of popularity with the advent of reinforcement learning. It refers to 
multiple decision-making entities, which we call agents. Now, each agent has a control that it uh, applies. Agent one applies decision U1, two applies U2 and so on. The overall control is the collection of uh, these decisions. And uh, the agents apply these decisions uh, by using information. The information is obtained from other agents or from the environment. And, uh, and uh, so it's a sequential decision process. At time zero, agent one applies a control U1. All the agents UI, uh, I apply the decision UI. Some information exchange takes place. A new state is generated. Then there is a decision making around again. Uh, information exchange, new state, and so on. So we are looking at a sequential decision making framework. Uh, applying decisions by this collection of agents in discrete time based on the information that we is received between applying this applying these decisions and now this is a complicated problem that involves many applications but it's very important to keep in mind the major mathematical distinction between different structures of this type the first one is the classical information pattern. I mentioned this in lecture three. In the classical information pattern, uh, the agents are fully cooperative. They fully share information and they never forget information. So they're really part of a team, a collaborative team, and they share all the information. Now, if this is the case, then we can view the collective decisions of the agents as a single decision, essentially applied by a single super agent, if you'd like. And with that view, we can apply dynamic program. Okay. So that's the main, main consequence of assuming this classical information pattern. It can be treated by dynamic programming, therefore bringing into uh, play the algorithms that we have been discussing and the full methodology of uh, dynamic programming. A far more difficult case, relatively speaking, is when you have a non-classical information pattern where the agents do not fully share information. They have some private information and they may also be antagonistic, like in a game, a game type of problem, either zero sum game or a, 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 a Nash type of game. Now, when you have a problem with this type of information pattern, it immediately becomes very hard because it cannot be treated by dynamic programming. Not only are approximations essential, but you have to be, they are very difficult to solve. In our course, we're going to stick with dynamic programming. We're going to assume a classical information pattern, but at critical points, we're going to venture into the non-classical information pattern case through various uh, generalizations. But the starting point is a classical information pattern, whereby the agents have exact state information. They share all the information that they need, and they choose their controls as functions of the state. So conceptually, you can view this uh, structure as involving some kind of a information collecting cloud, an information clearing house, so to speak, collects information from the agents, collects information from the environment through various sensors, condenses this information in all the information that the agents need and passes it on to the agents in the form of state information. So the state, the exact value of the state that I'm talking about here is given by the cloud, which collects all this information. That's a conceptual view. And of course it may be unrealistic in a given problem, but it's a good starting point to understand the classical information pattern structure. Okay, 
So now our model is going to be a stochastic dynamic programming model that we know and love from uh, our early lectures, finite or infinite horizon with a state denoted by x, xk for time k, control uk at time k. And the only way in which multi-agent problems differ from what we have been discussing so far is that the decision has this component structure. U, the control, involves M components, which correspond to M agents. Now, the term agents may be a little misleading. Agents is just a metaphor. The important structure is just components, M components. And these components may correspond to agents that are <coughs> geographically distributed within a certain area, or the components may reside on the same computer, okay? They may control different arms of the same robot that uh, based on computations that are done inside the robot. So agents is just something to gain intuition from, but it is not, uh, it's not, uh, it, the only characteristic is this multi-component structure. And this type of structure involves a lot of difficulty with computations, lots and lots of computation, because the search space, because of the multiple agents, may be enormous. So what we're going to set as our initial goal is to apply approximate dynamic programming and roll out ideas aiming at faster computation in order to deal with the exponential size of the search space, the control space, even if this use take two values apiece, the search space becomes two to the M, the size of the search space. And pretty quickly, it can get enormous. So we want to deal with that problem in various computations involving low loud approximation value space and so on. And there's a second uh, idea here. We want to, to allow these agents to have some autonomy, to be able to apply their controls simultaneously. Now, of course, it's a bit of a conflict here because they have to exchange information before they, uh, before they apply their controls. But uh, we're going to try to, to deal with this uh, difficulty. And in the process, we will deal in part with uh, issues that stem from a non-classical information pattern. Non-classical information patterns very much arise in systems where agents are autonomous and they don't quite have time to share their information. But we view this problem, this issue from the point of view of speeding up the computation through parallelism, parallelize the decisions of the agent controls. Okay, so now we are going to apply rollout to this multi-agent problem setting. And uh, the only thing that we are going to assume that's different is that U has this component structure. And, to, and what I'm going to talk about applies in finite horizon problems as well as infinite horizons problems. To simplify the notation, we're going to consider infinite horizon problem. And notice that the standard rollout operation in its exact form is this. What do we do here? We do at state x, we do approximation in value space by minimizing the approximate q factor of a base policy mu. In other words, we use one step look ahead with cost function approximation that is given by the cost function of this base policy mu. Now, because this is a base policy, sequential consistency holds, which is important for the analysis. Uh, however, when we look at this operation, we see that it's a major problem in the multi-agent setting. The search space, the minimization, uh, grows exponentially with M. So 
there may be just too many Q factors here to compute. And this is a difficulty. What comes to mind is simplified rollout, where instead we simplify this minimization. And one form of simplified rollout is this multi-agent rollout uh, methodology that I'm going to discuss now. Remember that simplified rollout under sequential consistency implies cost improvement. So I'm going to claim cost improvement at the end of the day. Now, how does this simplified rollout work? Well, instead of doing minimization over the joint decisions of all the agents taken together, we do minimization one agent at a time with intermediate communication of the controls chosen between the agents. So we are at state X, we want to simplify this operation. What do we do? Well, we have a base policy and we minimize over the controls of the first agent. Okay, so this is minimization not over the combined vector of agent controls, but just over a single agent control. And how about the controls of the other agents? Well, we use for the subsequent agents, we use the base policy controls. Given X, we can compute the base policy controls for agents two up to M, and we can set up this minimization with respect to the control of the first agent. Now, this may be a vastly simpler minimization than this. It has, has potentially a much smaller search space. So we do this minimization and we obtain mu tilde one of X. This is the rollout control of the first agent. And then we go to the second agent. We communicate to that second agent the rollout control that agent one has chosen. And we do a minimization over the control of the second agent only with the previous agent's control chosen already by rollout and the future agent controls chosen by the base policy. So that minimizes, this gives you the rollout control of the second agent. Then we go to the third agent, the fourth agent, and so on, up to the very last agent where we have already computed the rollout controls of agents one up to M minus one. And we minimize over the last, the control of the last agent. So starting from X, we have computed the rollout control by means of this one agent at a time minimization process. Now let's count the Q factors that this process involves. This is exponentially in M. However, the number of Q factors is linear now in M, assuming a fixed number of controls for each agent, a search space that involves like say two controls or a finite number of controls, then the number of Q factors goes linearly with M. M times single agent minimization. And that's a truly enormous speed up. But the other nice thing here is that this is simplified rollout with sequential consistently holding. As a result, we have cost improvement, which is sort of a good property to have. I'm going to explain this cost improvement in a different way also, but I think it's, it's, it's useful to keep in mind uh, one way, one avenue through which it is implied, which is the fact that we are doing simplified rollout here. Okay, now your class notes do not talk about uh, multi-agent uh, problems very much, but there's a long survey paper that I have uh, published recently. It's about 70 pages or so. Uh, and uh, it has uh, a lot of material, both on multi-agent rollout and also multi-agent policy iteration, a subject that we're going to talk about later in this course. And the paper can be found from my website. And uh, this is a survey paper, but the earlier papers from the last two years 
that are coded there with various variations of multi-agent rollout, various theoretical analysis, and so on. There's also a computational paper with multi-agent uh, rollout, which I'm going to discuss later in this lecture. Okay, so are there any questions on what we do in multi-agent rollout in this one agent at a time process? Okay, so let me illustrate multi-agent rollout in the context of this spiders and flies example. I think I mentioned this example in lecture three as well. Uh, we have, uh, okay, we have a grid uh, and uh, there are 15 spiders somewhere within this grid and they can move in the four directions, up, down, right, left, uh, or they can stay where they are. And the objective is to catch a number of flies in minimum time. And these flies are at various places in the grid and they move randomly uh, and they're totally blind. On the other hand, the spiders have per per perfect vision. They can see where the flies are exactly, even though they, each time they change position, of course, they can update uh, the location. They can follow, track visually the, uh, the flies. And uh, uh, moreover, they can see where the other spiders are. So at least they can visually coordinate, so to speak. So now, we have a multi-agent problem, right? Because uh, they have 15 agents, the 15 spiders, and each one has five possible moves. So the number of joint move choices is five to the 15, okay? Uh, an astronomical number. Now, multi-agent rollout will reduce this to five times 15, which is just 75 Q factors as opposed to that many Q factors while maintaining cost improvement. And it works by applying a sequence of one spider at a time moves. So the way it works, we have an order one to 15 on this 15 spiders. And the first spider uh, selects its uh, move by doing a rollout minimization, assuming that the other spiders use a base heuristic. And the base heuristic that they choose, we are going to assume here, some kind of a shortest path heuristic. Each spider moves to the nearest fly directly along the shortest path. So there is a base heuristic, a shortest path type of heuristic. And spider number one, assumes that the other spiders are going to follow this base heuristic, it's going to select one of the five possible choices. Communicates this choice to spider number two, which does the same, taking into account what spider number one has done and using the shortest path, uh, the shortest path uh, 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 moves that uh, for the other uh, spiders. And then spider number two chooses one of the five moves, communicates, broadcasts this move to all the other spiders. And then spider number three moves, four, five, all of them go in turn. Each time there's five choices and the total is five times 15 for 75 choices. Now, here the spiders make their moves uh, sequentially. So that slows down the process. In other words, spider number two cannot make any decision before it hears from spider number one and so on. Be these choices are serial in nature uh, and they are important because they imply coordination. Basically, fly, spider number one tells spider number two, I'm gonna go to this one. You better go to something, somewhere else because I'm gonna catch this one within the proper amount of time. On the other hand, we're going to try to, to introduce a limited form of coordination by using signal information, 
like some imprecise information about that coordinates the moves between the different spiders. And uh, we hope to gain some speed up because of the simultaneous choices of the spiders. And the speed up is going to be up to 15. Okay. Um, and uh, so for the moment, we're going to assume that we have full communication of the, of the spider moves to other spiders. And later, we're going to come back to this. OK, so I have a, a video illustration of this uh, process. And before I go into that, are there any questions about this, uh, uh, this uh, problem? OK, so let me go into the video. Now I have to. I'm going to show three possibilities. Uh, two spiders and two flies using the base, the spiders use the base policy, shortest path, the standard form of rollout, and the multi agent form of rollout. And the base policy is going to be to move along the shortest path to the closest surviving fly. And I'm going to use the Manhattan distance metric for calculating shortest paths. And uh, this base policy uses no coordination. All the spiders act, the two spiders, the four spiders act as if they were by themselves. There was no other spider by themselves. So now let me see if I can, if I'll manage to show you this video because I'm not very experienced. I'm digitally, digitally challenged, I should tell you that but you probably have figured it out already. So now I'm going to show the, this one here, the base policy. Okay, so Okay. Um, so we have uh, four spiders, and for this example, they are located right in the middle. Uh, and uh, there are two flies that move at random, okay? And these four spiders try to catch the spider, the, the, the spiders try to catch the flies in minimum time. So what would be the reasonable thing to do? Well, the reasonable thing to do would be to split off the spiders and two of them go one way, two go the other way. And also, since there are two of them and the flies move randomly, it may make sense to sort of try to encircle the, the spider. So if, I try, if randomly it goes away from one of the fly of the spiders, it can be caught by the other spider. Okay, on the other hand, this base heuristic is shortest path is selfish, no coordination, and let's see how it works. Okay, so now we see that the sp spiders do not split off. They go towards the closest uh, uh, fly. Uh, okay, in the Manhattan distance, uh, the spiders break ties by moving along the horizontal or are moving along the vertical. Two of them prefer the horizontal than the vertical. Uh, so now, with no coordination, they have all done the same thing, caught this uh, fly, and then they rush off to the other, uh, the other surviving fly uh, along the shortest distance based on the Manhattan metric and uh, the preference that they have between horizontal and vertical. Now, this guy here moves back and forth, up and down, and so on, but eventually, the spiders are going to get him. Okay, there's no way it can, can uh, escape. So I'm going to advance the video a little bit. Okay, so now, okay, they got him, okay. So that's not very smart, okay. Um, and it took 85 time units to capture both, uh, both uh, flies. 
so let's see now what the standard rollout will do, okay? This is not multi-agent, this is standard. So this minimizes over 625 Q factors at, um, uh, at each move. Uh, it's gonna take 34 moves at each one of these 34 time units is going to minimize over 625 Q factors. Moreover, these Q factors involve a stochastic system because the flies move randomly. So it will involve Monte Carlo simulation. So it's quite a bit of computation to compare 625 Q factors. But we're going to show the results here and see what kind of uh, policy you get. You expect it to be smarter, right? The rollout is supposed to be smarter than the base heuristic, given particularly that we have cost improvement. So let's see what we get. Here is the, here's what happens. Oops, sorry. Okay. So they both start at the same place. And uh, what we're here going to see is that they do something more intelligent. Two of them go that way and two of them go that way. They split off because they coordinate with each other through this, uh, through this, this joint move selection. Okay, two of them are going towards this one and two of them are going towards this one. They have perfect vision, but the flies move randomly now, right? And you see that they try also to do something that's a bit intelligent in that they try to, okay, still this has not been caught yet. This one has started going in the other direction, okay? Having caught this one, then it realized a good idea to go and try and catch this one. But of course it's unnecessary because these two are perfectly capable of catching this, uh, this eventually, the, the expected time to catch is very small. So that's what the standard rollout will do. And uh, now let's uh, see what the, the multi-agent rollout will do. Now this involves a lot more computation, only 20 Q factors for each time step and gives you the same capture time. It performs just as well. So let's see how this works. Again, the behavior is indistinguishable between uh, multi-agent and the uh, standard uh, rollout. Again, we have, um, we have split off between the spiders to the, towards the two different flies. And there's some attempt towards encirclement uh, once they get close to a particular fly. And the capture time is the same as for standard rollout. Okay, so are there any questions about this uh, demo? I realize that it's not, it's kind of primitive, okay? But, uh, okay, I haven't done many movies or that in, my, in my presentations. I haven't used them in my presentations so far. So I'm still a novice and uh, uh, it's a little primitive. However, I have, uh, I have uh, heard from one of you who is interested in doing a project, a term project involving spiders and flies, but a much fancier, uh, much fancier problem formulation involving, uh, involving a better video among others. So hopefully in the in next year's, uh, in next year's uh, uh, offering of the class, I'm going to have a better video to show. But for, but for the moment, that's all you get, okay. Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, so how, what would this look like in like a non-classical setting if, if the agents were being antagonistic? Would, would it be somehow like a, a competition to capture all the flies or is that what you sort of meant by that, antagonistic agents? Um, okay, uh, this problem does not lend itself to, uh, to 
an antagonistic setting. I mean, okay. what would be antagonizing here? Uh, the only way you can have uh, a zero-sum game out of this is when you have uh, attackers and defenders. So some spiders uh, are attacking the flies, and some spiders defend the flies, OK? Uh, that but, uh, the analogy doesn't hold up very well. Okay. Uh, so however, uh, it's a legitimate question on what do you do if you have both, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, multiple agents, uh, some of which uh, form a vector of minimizing a cost function that minimizes a cost function, and some of which form another vector that maximizes the cost function. So that would be a legitimate problem. It's an open question. It's an open research question of how multi-agent rollout would, uh, would apply to this setting. It has not been done. Uh, so if some of you want to look at this, uh, that would be an interesting subject mm. to explore either analytically or computationally. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'm not done with demos, and the next demo is uh, a little better. I'm sorry, I used the word demo, and uh, I meant video. Video demo is something that's supposed to be much more highbrow. Um, so let me go back to full screen. Okay, so now. Let's take a break. Take a break for like 15 minutes. And uh, I want you to, if you, if you wish, to, uh, to think about how we might approach this multi-agent setting and multi-agent rollout analytically. And I gave this figure in lecture number three, and I explained it very quickly, but now I want to go to, into it a little bit more in depth. Um, this involves a reformulation of the problem whereby each transition from state xk to xk plus one is split off, is, is unfolded into multiple transitions. The first transition involves choosing the first control component by agent number one. Without cost, we move to this state here, then choose a control, the control chosen by agent number two, it leads to this state and so on. So we choose controls one agent at a time and the last control involves the system equation, okay? Uh, to state xk plus one. Up to here we have xk and the first m minus one components. Having chosen the mth component, we are ready to move into state xk plus one according to this equation, because this UK involves all the components. And this last transition involves also the cost of the XK to XK plus one transition with a discount factor here. The preceding transitions involve no cost. Now, I want you to think why this problem formulation involving a different state space and a breakdown of the transitions in this way uh, why this is equivalent to the problem that I have been discussing. And I want you to think about applying standard rollout, not multi-agent, standard rollout to this reformulated problem, which involves choices of one uh, component at a time. And uh, also think about cost improvement how it comes into play in the context of this standard rollout. So think about all this, the transition from standard rollout to multi-agent rollout, this reformulation, which involves a more complicated state space, but a simpler control space. And uh, we're going to take this break for 15 minutes and come back at uh, six o'clock let's say six o'clock Arizona time. 
It's now uh, 5.43, according to my watch. Let me get back to this question. Um, any comments about, uh, about this formulation? Why is it equivalent? Um, and uh, how does it relate to, um, to uh, how does it connect standard rollout with multi-agent rollout? So it's using state space augmentation uh, for every state in the multi-agent rollout problem. You're sort of replacing it with uh, every possible sequence from one to m minus one, but also from one to m minus two uh, of these possible decisions. So, for example, the the number of sequences uh, for m minus one agents is going to be the size of the largest control set to the power m minus one. But then you also have to add all the ones for m minus two, m minus three, and so on down to one. So you have this sort of enormous explosion in the size of the state space uh, when you are converting it to a uh, standard rollout problem. Yeah. Yeah. The two problems are equivalent. In other words, the one where the transition is just straight from XK to XK plus one using a control that's a joint control over all the agents, okay? And the one that we're breaking down the decisions into uh, multiple decisions. Um, the policies for this problem, the reformulated problem, uh, can be represented also as policies of the original problem. If you take a a policy here that's a function of uh, the current state. Let's say this one is a function of the state XK and UK1. UK1 is given by some policy, so altogether U2 is also given by a policy. So you're not gaining any new policies in the in the in the uh, in the reformulated problem. Uh, and for every policy of the reformulated problem, there's a corresponding one of the standard problem with the same cost function. Therefore, the two problems are equivalent from the point of view of optimal policies and uh, optimal cost. But uh, as, uh, as uh, Jameson uh, mentioned, um, there is a, the, the state space grows enormously in this reformulated problem whereas the control space is simplified enormously at the same time. So we're trading off control and state complexity. It's an old idea, by the way. And, uh, uh, the, and what's happening here is that if you were to solve this problem exactly, you would have to deal with cost functions that relate to these parts of the state space additional cost functions in addition to j's of x. Uh, however, when it comes to rollout, that doesn't bother us because rollout does not look at the size of the state space at all. All it looks is just the current state and it looks to apply control out of the one control out of the admissible controls. And having to do that in stages makes things simpler for uh, rollout. Moreover, If you look at the structure of multi-agent rollout, it's just the same thing as standard rollout for the reformulated problem. And uh, whereas, as I said, uh, the size of the state space does not adversely affect the application of rollout. So we gain from this, we gain the cost improvement property. The uh, multi-agent rollout is standard rollout for the reformulated problem. Therefore, it improves the cost function of the reformulated problem, which is the same as the original problem. So that's one other way to, uh, to verify the cost improvement property for multi-agent rollout. There are three different ways. One is through simplified rollout analysis. The other one is what I just mentioned here. And the third one, which is analytical. You'll find all this in this survey paper that, uh, that I mentioned earlier. And of course, the main benefit here is that the one step look ahead branching factor is reduced from uh, 
n to the m to n times n, where n is the number of possible choice for each component. Okay, so let's go now into a special case, multi-agent MPC, okay? Um, MPC is uh, like rollout. Uh, so what does, uh, how, how can MPC benefit by applying multi-agent rollout? Well, there's one case that I can think of, per perhaps there are others. Suppose that, um, that you have MPC where the control consists of both discrete and continuous components. So it has a, a continuous component, which I call V, and it has some discrete components like integer values. Now, we motivated MPC uh, based on problems with continuous control space, but we made no assumptions about the structure of the control space. MPC, the analysis I gave you, the stability analysis, applies to discrete control spaces, continuous control spaces, or mixtures like here. And this kind of uh, situation can be useful in a number of settings. For example, this wise may be system configuration variables, uh, values of y, k, i being one or zero may correspond to different parts of the system being configured in the position one or zero. Like for example, in a, in a power system uh, problem where you want to address uh, economic power generation, this y, k, i's may correspond to the i unit, the i generating unit being online or offline, being on or off. And uh, in power systems, very often, uh, in fact, as a matter of course, you have generating units turn on when there is period of high demand and turn off when it's period of low demand. So turning a unit on and off is part of the optimization. Uh, and uh, then there are also continuous variables, how much electricity to generate from the power from the power uh, plants and uh, okay so this is uh, this is an example where this situation may occur now if you try to apply plain vanilla mpc with a control space like that you have a serious problem because the mpc problem the mpc minimization over l steps becomes an integer programming problem with a potentially large number of integer variables. This wise complicate the solution a lot. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and therefore, it would be nice if you could treat this wise one at a time as you would in a multi-agent uh, uh, type of uh, rollout. So how would you apply that kind of uh, rollout in this setting? You need a base policy which may consist of a nominal configuration that depends on the state. So the base policy gives you for each state a set of discrete components and a continuous component, a continuous control policy. And in a component by component, a multi-agent version of MPC at state XK, we first choose the discrete variables one at a time, an easy optimization problem with all future components fixed at the values determined by the nominal configuration. And then after you have chosen this Y values, choose the continuous component to drive the state to zero in L steps with minimum cost with the discrete components fixed at the values that you have calculated earlier. So this simplifies a great deal the MPC problem and separates the difficult minimization over the y variables from the continuous minimization over vk. And these minimizations can be approached with different methodology, like the continuous minimization may be approached with nonlinear programming, whereas the integer minimization may be approached with combinatorial integer type of uh, uh, integer programming type of methods. So um, that's the, uh, in a nutshell, the uh, the idea here, making the look ahead 
minimization simpler by separating the components and treating them one at a time. And the stability property and the cost improvement property of MPC is maintained because multi-agent rollout has a cost improvement property. And it's also a simplified form of rollout, a simplified form of MPC. So are there any questions here? Okay, let me go into the question of autonomy. We want the agents to act uh, more or less independently and not wait for each other to apply uh, their controls in, a se in sequence. On the other hand, the multi-agent uh, rollout operation is inherently serial. Um, so how can we parallelize it first to get extra speed up and also be able to introduce some agent autonomy into the process? Okay, so what's the obstacle to parallelization? To compute the agent L rollout control, we need the rollout controls of the preceding agents, right? This is how multi-agent rollout works. We choose the rollout controls of the agents one at a time, and we pass on the values to the future agents, to the next agents. So the reason we have to wait and do things serially is because of this need to communicate of early agents communicate their controls to subsequent agents in the order. Now, the idea here to remedy this is, is to use pre-computation. Pre-compute the rollout controls and use guesses this mu hats in place of the preceding rollout controls. Do some pre-computation and figure out what are the rollout controls roughly that the multi-agent rollout algorithm would apply at state X and give them to the agents so they don't have to wait to hear from the other agents in applying their own controls. They use this mu hats in place of the mu tildes. Now this opens a great deal of uh, a great number of possibilities. One possibility that comes immediately to mind is for the agents to use, instead of the rollout controls of the preceding agents, use the base policy controls. In other words, use as mu hat the base policy mu for each agent. But I'm going to argue that this may not work well, may be quite unreliable because essentially that throws away all kinds of coordination between the agents. Another possibility is to do some pre-computation and train a neural network to emulate approximately the rollout policy controls and use the output of the neural network and, uh, and, and thereby obviating the need for serial computation. The agents do not wait to hear from other agents. They simply use the neural network output, which has been trained offline. And there are also other possibilities that are problem specific. Now, I'm going to show you what will happen. First, what will happen if you use this approach, which is the simplest, right? You don't have to do any pre-computation you use base policy controls in place of rollout controls in a multi-agent setting. Um, and here's an example. Using, using the base policy for signaling, and what's the pitfall with that? <clears throat> Here we have two spiders and two flies, and uh, they're on the line, and the spiders try to catch the flies in minimum time, and the flights are stationary. They're not moving randomly as they were moving in the, in the grid example. The spiders have perfect vision, perfect information, and the flies do not move. And let's consider a base policy 
whereby each spider moves one step towards the closest surviving fly. So let's say that this is the state. The two spiders are in these locations. And uh, uh, OK, so spider one looks at the two flies and says, which one is closer to me? That's fly number two. So it moves one step towards that. Spider number two does the same thing, looks at this fly number one, fly number two, and moves again to its closest one. And uh, uh, they don't make any attempt to coordinate. And that's the base policy. So given a state, we look at the closest flies and we move the spiders one step towards them. On the other hand, this is not optimal, right? Because for example, for this state here, the base policy would move both, fly, both spiders towards this fly. This spider is going to arrive first. And at that point, they both reverse course and go towards the fly number one, right? They move one step towards the closest surviving fly. On the other hand, the optimal thing to do is clearly to split the spiders and have one go in one towards one fly and the other one go to the other fly. Uh, so the split has to be done so that this one does not go to this and this one goes to that. They split towards their closest flies. That's clearly the optimal policy. It requires it, uh, it uh, catches the flies in minimum time. Is this clear? Is it, are, are you guys following? What's happening? Are there any questions? I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, okay, I'm glad, glad to hear that. Ask questions even if, uh, if it is clear, okay? <laughs> because I get, uh, I get, um, uh, I just uh, get to speak to myself only and that's not very good. Okay, so okay, so that's pretty pretty easy to see that the optimal solution is to go towards the closest flies. Now, something that's not obvious is that if you apply the standard rollout, not multi-agent, but just the standard rollout where the spiders jointly choose their moves, it turns out that the standard rollout is optimal for all the initial states. No matter where you start it will be optimal. Of course, this connects to the cost improvement property of rollout, but it's, uh, it's nice to see that it actually works optimally for all the initial states. And um, okay, so I'm going to go through this very quickly, but I'm going to ask you to do this as, as an optional homework to verify that this is indeed true. Okay, the standard rollout. Okay, I'm going to do this. It turns out that the agent by agent, the multi-agent rollout is also optimal for all initial states. And this can also be verified. And let me sketch the proof of that. Let's say spider number one uh, selects a move first and then spider number two will select. Then spider number one looks at the two Q factors, going here and then going here and going here and then going again here because the base heuristic is go towards the closest, the closest fly. Now, it assumes also that uh, the, so it, it contemplates this Q, two Q factors and it assumes that spider number two and subsequent choices of spider number one are going to be based on the base heuristic, go towards the nearest fly. So if we go and choose this move, this Q factor, we're going to end up closer to this fly, but fly number two is going to end up catching that fly first. So this move was wasted. On the other hand, this move here is going to gain a leg up, it's, we're going to be once spider number two catches uh, fly number two, we're going to be one step closer to catching fly number one. 
And if you compare this Q factor and this Q factor, this one will win. As a result, spider number one is going to move, is going to choose this move. And then it's pretty easy to see that spider number two is going to choose that move. So in this, in, with this implicit coordination, trying to take into account what the other spider is going to do based on the using the base policy allows us to differentiate between the two Q factors and choose the optimal one. So that's roughly the idea, but I want you to verify that. It's going to be a good exercise of whether you understand the definitions, uh, if you can figure it out, if you can figure out that this, these two statements are indeed true. Okay, so this is agent by agent rollout, taking into account the rollout control of the preceding policies. Now, suppose that we use signaling using the base policy, then there is no coordination between the spiders. And it actually turns out that rollout with this base policy signaling works optimally for most of the initial states. But there's a significant exception. Suppose that the spiders start at the same location, one on top of the other then if they have no coordination, they're going to move towards their closest, uh, the, 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 the rollout algorithm with this uh, signaling policy. Um, it's not going to be able to differentiate between the two directions. And if one chooses in one direction, the other one will also choose in the other direction. So they will always move in unison and they will be oscillating and never catch the flies. In particular, if both of them start in this location, roll out with a base policy for signaling is going to move in the wrong direction. It's going to take us all the way to the left up to the point where we reach the middle. And at that point, we reverse course and then go back and forth like that. You can, if you wish to try to write a little software program to test this, uh, this behavior, and that would be a good exercise if you prefer that from analysis, but you can see this from analysis as well. So let me not uh, discuss this point further. I leave this to you as an exercise to verify it, but I'm going to show you a similar phenomenon in the video that I'm going to, to, uh, to, to, to go into now. Are there any questions? Okay, so this is uh, this is the recent paper that uh, I did with four of my ASU colleagues, Shmita Balacharya, Siva Kailas, Sehil Bayal, who, by the way, is our grader for this course, uh, Professor Stephanie Gill, who has moved now to Harvard, and uh, this is a paper that we wrote a few months ago. And you can find a copy from my website. And it deals with uh, multi-robot repair of a network of damaged sites. OK, so we have here a network of uh, sites. Think of a pipeline here, a pipeline network. Uh, and some parts, some, some of in these locations, there are several locations in this uh, network that may be damaged. Uh, may have sustained some damage, uh, and there are five different levels of damage, and there, uh, there, there, there are, they are illustrated here by this symbols. So this corresponds to damage level zero, which is like this site is undam not damaged. Uh, level one, like this one, slightly damaged. Level two, a little more damaged level three, even more damage, and that's the worst kind of damage, okay? Now there's a cost to be paid for leaving an unrepaired site, uh, for leaving a site unrepaired. And a, comp a big complication here is the fact that we don't know the damage level of each site. Uh, 
we can only find out about it if we actually the robot goes there and inspects the location, in which case it finds out the level of damage. Moreover, the damage level uh, changes over time. It deteriorates according to a known Markov chain. So from slightly damaged can go to more damaged and even more damaged and so on over time. So what we have here is, uh, is a pump DP. Uh, a partial state, partial observation Markovian decision problem where the exact state is not known, but we receive observations about that state. And what are these observations? They are these inspections. When the robots go to the different sites, they observe the condition of the site and they ascertain which level of damage it has sustained. So here, the state is the set of robot locations. Here we have four robots, okay? This, this, there are four of them and they can be anywhere in the pipeline and they move one step per time unit, one step at a time. And the state of the system is a set of robot locations and the conditions of the, the damage level of the sites. And each one can have five different levels. So the number of states is astronomical. Even if you had perfect state information, the number of states would be astronomical. Moreover, here you have partial state information, which means that the state of the system is actually the belief state over the state, the set of probability distributions over the site damages, plus of course, the set of robot locations. So we have a POM DP, the belief state evolves according to a known process because we assume that there's a Markov chain here that's, uh, that's uh, known. Uh, how the damage levels uh, progress uh, probabilistically. And the control choice of each robot is to, given that it is a certain location, either inspect and if it's damaged to repair or to inspect and move to a neighboring site. However, repairing takes one time unit, which is time that you may need to go and visit a more damaged location. So the trade-off here is uh, fixing damages early, spreading out the robots more or less evenly within this pipeline, and also take care of urgent damages, damages at the highest level, which cost more per unit time. You want to rush robots towards this highly, this, this most damaged locations so that they don't cost you as much. So that in a nutshell is the problem. It's a very, very challenging problem. Uh, and, uh, and we have addressed it with, uh, with rollout, but uh, unless you use multi-agent rollout, the problem becomes extremely difficult because there are just too many Q factors here. And this Q factor to calculate costs you because you need Monte Carlo simulation. Here we have shown, I'm showing four agents, but the number of agents may be larger, maybe, maybe 10, 15, 20, already very high numbers. But in other versions of this problem, in other settings, the number of agents may be in the hundreds, okay? Uh, so any, any thought of standard rollout is out of the question. And multi-agent rollout becomes the, the only hope that I know of, at least if you want to apply an approximation in value space type of uh, uh, method. So that's the problem. And uh, I'm going to show you some videos of uh, solution to give you an idea of uh, how this uh, multi-agent rollout works uh, with uh, possibly signaling or without signaling. Are there any questions? 
Is the problem formulation clear? We have a POM DP with an already very complicated but discrete state. And uh, however, the POM DP involves a belief state. That's the one that we are operating on. And this is a continuous uh, uh, state, uh, space of probability distribution. We have multiple agents and uh, we have uh, we have uh, a system equation that involves the belief state and uh, Q factors are calculated by Monte Carlo simulation using the known Markov chain. <coughs> uh, one question, are all agents aware of the same most up-to-date belief state? Yes. Uh, yeah, we assume that um, that the inspection results go up to some computational cloud that calculates the belief state and passes it on to the agents. Okay, understood. And um, uh, now, in our formulation so far, we have considered. Uh, damages that are uncorrelated with respect to location. In other words, the damage is this location is uncorrelated with damage in neighboring locations. This simplifies the problem because the belief state becomes, uh, becomes uh, uh, a Cartesian product of probability distributions uh, corresponding to the different sites. This is called a decentralized POM DP or deck POM DP in the literature of POM DP problems. The more complicated problem is when there are correlations between the probability distributions of the different sites, and then there is no way to pass on the probability distribution to the agents because it's a very complicated object. And that would uh, therefore necessitate that the computational cloud Pass uses some kind of neural network to represent the, the, the belief state and passes on the neural network output to the, uh, to the agents. Of course, that's, uh, that's, that's a more complicated version of the problem. And uh, I don't know how it would uh, work out, but uh, it's, uh, it's one step in, um, uh, it's the next step one of the next steps from what we have done so far. Okay, so now I have, I'm gonna show you three videos, three of those four. One is the base policy uh, where all the agents, all the robots, they go to the nearest site, each one goes to its own nearest site that has some damage. In other words, has a probability distribution that uh, is uh, that indicates that some damage is possible. And uh, that's uh, the decision it makes. It uh, and also the base policy. If it finds a site that has damage, it fixes it. Uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't skip it to go to a more urgent, uh, uh, to, to go and address a more urgent repair. So the base policy is uh, pretty naive, okay? It's shortest path, the greedy and so on. And, and then the other video is, has to do with multi-agent rollout where the robots, uh, they choose, uh, they make moves, they make control, they make choices serially, one after the other. So Robert number one chooses what it wants to do and then sends the information to Robert number two, three and four, okay? So this is the multi-agent rollout algorithm. Now, this algorithm here is multi-agent but trying to cut corners, introduce signaling, and in particular the base policy signaling, like in this two spiders and two flies example that I gave earlier. Now, 
we're going to see some pretty bad stuff from this one. And we also have another uh, another uh, video where the signaling has been calculated with a pre-trained policy network. And uh, I'm not sure that I, I, I can show you that, but here are the results, okay? The base policy cost, and this is a discounted problem. We formulated it as a discounted uh, infinite horizon problem. Uh, the base policy cost is uh, calculated to be 52.94, takes 30 steps to fix all the damages, uh, assuming that once you fix a damage, it doesn't become, the site does not become damaged again. So fixes are sort of permanent. Multi-agent rollout takes a lot less, um, nine steps. This one with base policy signaling works pretty bad, okay? And I'll show you why. And uh, with signaling, uh, based on a pre-computed neural network policy is in between these two. It tries to emulate this, but it does so approximately, only approximately. Therefore, it loses some performance, which is reflected both in cost and in number of steps to terminate. Now I'm going to discuss rollout here, but I will return to this problem in the future in the context of policy iteration, infinite horizon policy iteration, a multi-agent type of policy iteration. So now let's see, I have to show you the videos. I'm gonna show you this one first. Okay, just one moment. Okay, the base policy. Okay, this is a higher quality video than the one I had before. And I have deliberately started all the robots in the same location. Now, this base policy, the shortest path of greedy policy has no coordination. And what you expect it to do is the robots ignore what the other robots are doing. They all go to the closest damage site. And because they start at the same location, they will all be doing the same thing, the exact same thing. So let's see if that happens. They start here and they all do go to the same place. One of them fixes the, uh, the site while the others have to wait. Notice that new damages pop up, become worse. But this one has perfect vision uh, about, um, about which sites are damaged, uh, somewhat damaged, and it moves accordingly. Uh, and now it's finished. And uh, here's the cost, uh, accumulated cost in this 30 stages. Okay, so the base policy has no coordination. Let's look at the let's look at the multi-agent rollout without signaling. Okay. So now all of them start at the same location, but they tell each other what they are doing. So we expect it, uh, we expect to see uh, the robots uh, splitting up and say like robot number one says, uh, well, I'm going to go this way, you go some other way. And this guy's, uh, and, and then all this information is passed around and they intelligently divide their tasks among themselves and spread out throughout the pipeline. So there you see some of them go one way, some of them, they split off and uh, pretty quickly after nine stages, they have uh, cleaned up the pipeline and the cost is much lower. Okay. So now I'm going to show you
oops, that's not the one I want. Okay, so this is multi-agent rollout with base policy signaling. In other words, the agents don't wait to hear from the other agents, but instead assume that they will be using the base policy. Okay, now this is like the bad case of the two spiders and two flies example. Let's see what happens. They just can't make up their mind and they go back and forth uh, and, uh, and uh, okay, they never accomplish anything. And uh, the cost will stay finite because uh, this is a discounted problem, okay? Well, discounted problems have finite costs, but it's clearly very bad. And so obviously this policy is doing some very, very bad things. What's the reason that it goes back and forth like this? Well, let's take the first one agent. The agent considers its uh, Q factors, the Q factor of going here and the Q factor of going here. Now, okay, so this is agent number one that's considering these two Q factors and it has to figure out what agent number two is going to do. Now it assumes that agent number two is going to use the base policy. So agent number two is going to go here, the closest damage. So agent number one says that this agent is going to fix this damage. So I shouldn't be going this way. I should be going that way. And that's why it decides to, take, to make this move. Now agent number two is going to think exactly the same way. And it also is going to move to this side because it thinks that this one is going to go that way. And uh, similarly, all of them have group think. They all think that somebody else is going to do something different than they, what they're actually doing. And they move back and forth like this. Well, that's the danger of using signaling with a base policy that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, it's it just it neglecting any kind of coordination between the agents. Okay, are there any questions about what's uh, happening here? What's the confusion, be, what, what, the, what, the, what the difficulties are with this, uh, this policy? Okay, so let me show you the last one, which is, uh, which tries to emulate by using a neural network. It tries to emulate this multi-agent rollout policy. Okay, I'm gonna go quickly through that. It's going to do similar things, but less perfectly. Again, you can see that the agents split up they have split up and, uh, but they're doing it uh, less intelligently with less efficiency because the neural network is not passing correct information, entirely correct information. So as a result, you have, uh, you have that uh, with neural network signaling, we get something, we get a performance that's in between these two. Okay, so this was my last slide, or next to last. I have one more slide about what we're going to do next time. Are there any questions? Here's your last last opportunity to ask questions. I have one. Um, yeah. How? What kind of data is used to train that neural network in the last example? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, we want to obtain a policy network that emulates the rollout policy. So we simply run the rollout policy, obtain training data from the rollout, from the rollout policy. In other words, at different states, we, we obtain data as to what the rollout policy, the exact rollout policy will do. 
the multi-agent rollout policy. Mm. And then we train the neural network on that data. It's going to construct a policy that's going to be sort of similar to the rollout policy, but not exactly the same because the training is imperfect, okay? So the data is based on multiple runs of the multi-agent rollout uh, policy, or the, yeah, the multi-agent rollout example. Yes, and this is all done offline. offline. You do a lot of computation offline in order to be able to do faster computation online, I in order okay. to avoid to have ready-made pre-computed coordination, basically. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Excuse me, Professor. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I just want to know, uh, is it possible to solve this problem with the, uh, I mean, rollout itself, the, the one that all agents decide at once? Yes, uh, yes, but it's uh, very time consuming. It's possible in mm -hmm. principle to solve it. Um, oh, okay, okay. And then uh, we should expect it to have better results or at least the same result as a uh, um, multi-agent rollout, right? The theory does not tell you whether one form of rollout is better than the other. The standard rollout or the multi-agent versions. There is no clear superiority of one over the other. What's going to happen in an individual, in a, in a particular case like this problem, uh, is not very clear. We haven't tried it because the standard rollout is too time consuming, okay? A lot more Q factors mm -hmm. to calculate. Basically, it requires four. Okay, this. Okay, each agent has a number of degrees of freedom, right? And also fix or not fix. So it's something like, uh, like, four to some power. Okay, uh, that depends on the branching factor here. So, with ten agents, it becomes overwhelming. With four agents, perhaps we could have done it, okay? Uh, but we haven't, we just haven't done it. Uh, so in principle, there is no clear superiority, analytically speaking, there's no clear superiority of multi-agent rollout versus, versus the standard rollout. In practice, however, the two, at least for this type of problem and for the spiders and flies type of problem, they're pretty much the same, okay? There's no, there's no intuition that would favor one type of algorithm over the other. That's all I can say for the moment. And uh, I've been, I've been, we're doing other experiments at the moment, and we hope to have uh, uh, more insight into this question uh, going forward. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question about a neural network. So, yeah. so because your policy is changing with time, so when you when you generate a new policy, the, the network will also change, right? Well, for a given problem, uh, in a given base policy, we assume that the base policy is sort of fixed. Okay. Uh, uh, if we change the base policy, of course, the rollout policy is going to change and the neural network will have to change. But ordinarily, the base policy does not change, okay? And here, if you try to make the base policy more complicated, you're going to have difficulty. So the A neural network... Go ahead. So the neural network is just to use to fit the base policy. The rollout policy, not the base policy. Oh, the rollout. The, ba the base policy is is sort of something simple, like a shortest path type of uh, <clears throat> go to the nearest damage site type of uh, uh, policy. It's the rollout policy that's hard to calculate because it requires a lot of computations. And we pre-compute an approximation to that using a policy network. OK, OK. Okay. Excuse me.
excuse me just one let me configure my my screen here okay okay we went through this we went through this demo okay so we are done for today about the next lecture uh, there's one more lecture that we're going to do on rollout algorithms. And that's very different than what uh, we have done. Uh, that's different than what we have done today. Uh, we're going to go back to deterministic problems and, uh, and discrete optimization problems, difficult combinatorial and discrete optimization problems, like the traveling salesman problem, but more, but, but much more difficult. And we are going to introduce a constrained form of rollout, whereby the, this multi-agent, the control has multiple components. However, there are constraints that couple the components. And that makes the rollout application more difficult. So, the ideas are sort of similar to what we covered so far. However, the problems are going to be different. They're going to have a combinatorial character and deterministic, okay? Okay, here is your homework. I think I've mentioned, I have sent out an announcement. Uh, exercise 2.3 of the latest version of the class notes. This is a more meaty homework. So far we had a sort of toy homeworks. Uh, the, this homework has a little bit more substance and it's going to be the basis for the homework after that, which is going to be the last one. And it's due Sunday in uh, 10 days or so. I want you to try as an optional homework, but highly recommended, to verify the statements of this pitfall slide about the two spider and two flies example. It's going to be sort of a test as whether we understood this material on the rollout. If you are able to do this, uh, to verify the statements in the slide, that's a pretty good indication that you are on solid ground in terms of your understanding. Uh, about your term project, uh, I have mentioned earlier that uh, there are no fixed office hours in this course, but I still want you to consult me about your project. So uh, the way we meet in this course is by Zoom. We make an appointment first by email. I'm going to we'll go pretty quickly set up this appointment and then we can talk by Zoom. So bear this in mind in case you are ready to talk to me. And if you're not ready to talk to me, uh, then uh, you may think about your project and if you decide I'm available. Uh, I'd like you at some point, and I can't remember exactly when the deadline is, to submit to me a one page proposal about your term project. So please don't forget that. Okay, so that's it for today. Are there any questions? Okay, guys, well, take care and we'll see you next week.